guys, this is the next section of the Cold War. Um, your notes may say Section 2 here. Uh, this slide that I'm working with today says Section 1. Um, but again, your, your notes may say Section 2. So either way, the title should be called The Cold War Begins. All right. Uh, we left off last time talking about kind of the end of the Cold War, or end of World War II, excuse me, and how we divided up Germany and, and kind of the rest of the world. So we're going to kind of continue on with that today. While the Soviet Union and the United States had been united in World War II to defeat the Axis powers, we were far from um, allies kind of off the battlefield, as long as the battlefield is when we're sharing together on the same side. Um, the United States is a capitalist democracy, and the Soviet Union is not. They they are a, a communist dictatorship uh, run at this point in time by Joseph Stalin. That leader will change over the years, obviously, uh, but for today's purposes, Joseph Stalin. At the Yalta Conference, it was clear that the Allies would defeat Germany soon, but it was still unclear how Germany and the territories they had taken would be governed after the war. Stalin wanted to keep Germany weak and divided, and Eastern Europe and one in Eastern Europe, much of it, the Soviet Union had already occupied because they liberated it from the Nazis. The United States and Great Britain wanted a stronger united Germany and in independent countries based on self-determination. Now, Stalin had agreed to hold free elections and have broadly representative governments in these countries, and he lied. He never followed through on that promise. Um, I mentioned that in the last section we went over. And those elections never happened. And these countries, such as Poland and Romania and Czechoslovakia, become satellite states to the Soviet Union. All right. There's our map again on the right side of your slide. And then the political cartoon under that is one of your vocab words illustrating it. So we'll get to that in just a second. Truman, who had taken over as president after... Uh, Roosevelt's death. Clement Attlee and Stalin meet at Potsdam in the summer of 1945. Here, Attlee and Truman tried to get a true commitment from Stalin to hold those free elections. And like I said, he, you know, just kind of gives them the runaround. Truman leaves the conference believing that the Soviet Union is planning world conquest, and he is right to a certain degree. Um, the stage was set for a 46-year struggle and rivalry between the United States and the Soviet Union that we call the Cold War. The reason it's called the Cold War is because it's the absence of a hot war. We never actually had shots fired at the Soviet Union or from the Soviet Union. Um, and so because we never really get into a hot war with the Soviet Union directly in time over these 46 years, it is a Cold War with them. Winston Churchill, in an important speech at Fulton College in Missouri, noted that, quote, an iron curtain had descended across the continent. So that's what that political cartoon on the right side of the, of the slide is referring to there. All right. Truman shared Churchill's beliefs regarding this iron curtain. He was a Missouri guy himself. Uh, I'm going to include a video to go along with this segment. We'll go over Truman's early life, his education, kind of how he grew up. Um, so make sure you take about two or three minutes to watch that. It's got some good information in it. The Truman Doctrine opposed communist expansion. In March 12, 1947, Truman addressed both houses of Congress and described the plight uh, that he referred to uh, of Greece and Turkey and many other countries facing communist influence, but the main two countries who referred to in his speech were Greece and Turkey. He was asking for funding to, quote, support free peoples who were resisting attempted conquest by armed minorities or outside pressures. He never really says the word communism or the Soviet Union in this speech, but the Congress knew who he was referring to. And so what he wanted was for Congress to allow him to send money, not troops, okay, we're not going to get into another war, but to send money to countries to help them remain non-communist. So any country, the Truman Doctrine says, as this becomes to be known, any country that's avoiding or trying to avoid being a communist country, if they need help, the United States will send them money to help them. George Keenan contended that while Stalin was determined to expand the Soviet Empire, he would not risk the security of the Soviet Union to do it. So he believed Stalin would only try to expand 
without serious risk and only if they could avoid a war with the United States. So containment, he argued, would not be a quick solution to our conflict with communism, but it would be effective. Uh, the illustration I've heard to kind of describe containment as a foreign policy method for communism for is you think of a fire in a fireplace, and that fire will remain a fire and remain going as long as you keep adding wood to the fire, so if you keep feeding it, and as long as it can get oxygen, right? So, like, if you have a fireplace in your house and you want to go to sleep for the night, you don't want to keep messing with the fire, all you have to do is not put more wood on the fire and close the glass doors, and, and just and eventually that fire will burn out. So, it took 46 years for communism to burn out, but our entire foreign policy going forward for the next 46 years is to keep communism within its current borders. That's why we make all the decisions that we make going into Korea, going into Vietnam, um, to try to keep communism in the borders that it's in at the time, 1948. Okay. The first great success of this policy of containment came in Western Europe in 1948, Revealed by George C. Marshall, Congress approved something called the Marshall Plan. Over the next four years, the United States gave about $13 billion in grants and loans to Western Europe. Uh, the plan was to provide any necessary goods to meet the needs of countries impacted by the war, foster a good relationship with those countries, and prevent those countries from taking grants and loans from communist countries. The Berlin Airlift is another good example. That. After World War II, Germany was split into East and West Germany. We talked about that already. And the capital city, which was in East, Ber East uh, Germany, of Berlin, was also split into East and West Berlin. West Berlin was, a f was free of communist influence by law, and therefore Stalin saw that as a threat. So in June of 1948, Stalin decided to stop all highway, railway, and waterway traffic from West Germany into West Berlin. This was essentially Stalin's method of, of laying siege to this half of the city without firing a shot, without getting, you know, a weapon out. He's going to attempt to wait the city out, to kind of force them to need a communist handout for them not to starve. Without any means of receiving aid, West Berlin would soon have no choice but to follow the communists. However, Stalin could not stop supplies in the air, like George Keenan thought. He's not going to risk getting into an actual fight with the United States to expand his empire. So for, for over a year, really, that's a typo, the United States and Great Britain dropped supplies to West Berlin in what became known as the Berlin Airlift and showed the world just how far the United States would go to contain communism. I'll have a video uh, that will go over this as well. It's two or three minutes long. It'll, it'll be on Google Classroom for you. The Berlin Airlift, like I said, demonstrated how far we were willing to go to make sure containment would be successful uh, if Western nations were willing to work together and take necessary action. Because it wasn't just us, right? It wasn't just us. We were uh, using Great Britain to help us as well, and we were taking off from Great Britain. So it wasn't just British pilots, it wasn't just American pilots. We worked together to make uh, the Berlin Airlift be successful. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, formed in 1949, provided the military alliance to counter Soviet aggression. Twelve Western European nations uh, and North American nations agreed to act together in defense of Western Europe. They formed a military alliance known as Collective Security. In response to NATO, um, the Soviet Union came up with something called the Warsaw Pact. It was similar to NATO. It was an alliance based on Collective Security, but they were communist countries. I will also have a video for the, well, it's right here, even linked. That's great. Um, but I'll link it separately on Google Classroom for you that will go over NATO and the Warsaw Pact, and they'll list all the countries um, that took part in, in that. Okay, that is the end of this section, uh, section one, section two. I don't know what your paper says. Like I said, these notes, I've just kind of changed the title of them over the years and kind of reorganized them. So your paper may say section one or two, as long as it says the Cold War begins, right? Um, you're, you're in the right spot. That is the end of the of that section. Um, we will go over the Korean War in our next section. For